I am so excited about this. This is my very favorite thing to talk about. And so um, that's, we're going to do this. Here we go. Would you put up the first slide with a scripture on it, please, my friends in the back? I'm going to read from that. So here's a few of my favorite scriptures when it comes to talking about hearing God's voice. First Kings chapter, I can't even read that chapter number, 19, here we go. Then he said, go out and stand at the mountain in the Lord's presence. At that moment, the Lord passed by. A great mighty wind was tearing at the mountains and was shattering cliffs before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but again, the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper. Jesus says in John chapter, chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. But my absolute favorite scripture or story in the Bible about hearing God's voice comes from 1 Samuel chapter 3. So hear these words. The boy Samuel served the Lord in Eli's presence. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare and prophetic visions were not widespread. One day, Eli, whose eyesight was failing, was lying in his usual place. Before the lamp of God had gone out, Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was located. Then the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here I am. He ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me? I didn't call, Eli replied. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Once again, the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. I didn't call you, my son. He replied, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Once again, for the third time, the Lord called to Samuel. He got up, went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the boy. So he told Samuel, go and lie down. If he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in the place. Now listen to these words, it's so beautiful. The Lord came, he stood there, and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel responded, speak, for your servant is listening. God, would we, we be those sort of people? I, I want to be a person who knows you and just knows your voice and recognizes it. Um, I just want a good relationship with you, and I think all of us in here do. And so would you just make us this year, would you make us people who just know you better, who love you more deeply, who have just really good, not weird, but just beautiful, authentic, alive relationships with you? And everyone who agreed with that said, amen? amen. One more time, amen? amen. Beautiful. Birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 28, still alive, not 30, bless God. Have you ever read or heard stories like this and thought, I want that? Do you listen to the pastor who, can, who constantly says that she has heard a word from God and wonder if that's something just for pastors? Do you have the friend who continuously says that they heard God say something in their prayer time and deep down you're disappointed because you want that same sort of relationship with God? Have you ever felt like you may have heard God say something to you but wondered if his voice is supposed to be audible or just kind of like a feeling? Have you struggled with the question, is this my thought or is this from God? Have you seen people you care about get hurt because what they felt like God said for them to do didn't work out? Have you been ever, ever been hurt by people misusing the words, God led me or God told me? Have you become maybe a little hesitant or maybe cynical because you've read about some pretty whack things that have happened to people or people have done in the name of God saying so? Or maybe have you just ignored God for so long in your own life that you feel like he'd never speak to you? Has that been you? It's certainly been me. Friends, you're in good company. Because for the next few weeks, we're just gonna explore and practice what it means to hear from God. And my like, greatest desire, if I could like, have a birthday wish, it would be that we would be people who know, just, who know Jesus and who hear his voice and have an alive, vibrant relationship with God. Does anyone else in the room want that? They want to be that sort of people. Okay, so let's just get down to the practice. Like, how do we hear, or how does God speak? And so there's a, a ton of different ways throughout Scripture God speaks. God speaks audibly. There's moments like this where people heard with their own ears God's voice. God speaks through miracles and signs. Every time we see a miracle that happens, that's actually God speaking and showing his thoughts, his will, his emotions, his intentions for the world. 
The Bible tells us in Romans 1 that God speaks through creation. All throughout scripture and even in people's lives, their experiences. I actually have a story in my own life where my family thinks I saw an angel when I was a kid. And I know Tom, I've heard actually multiple people tell stories where they feel like God showed up. And actually, I think it's Paul, uh, either Paul, yeah, it's Paul or Peter who talks about how we have to be careful who we're hospitable to because you may not know, you might be being rude to someone who might be an angel or messenger from God. That's in the Bible. Crazy, right? God speaks through dreams or God speaks through people. And that's one of the most common ways that we hear God's voice through our relationships, through people around us. God is actually actively speaking through people in our lives. God speaks through dreams and visions. And a lot of times we get kind of like, oh, what's a dream or vision? No, like those are normal things we have throughout our day where you just, something comes to your mind or when you're sleeping, you hear stories or you have imagination as you sleep. And sometimes they may not just be a dream that you're having because you ate, I'm not gonna make fun of food. You ate something really late at night. It might actually be a space where God's speaking. I actually remember this past summer in August, I had a dream that was just so vivid and, and just kind of out there and it just kept replaying in my mind that I actually took time to pray about it. And as I thought about it and prayed about it more, I was like, wait a second, this actually might be a way God was speaking through something in my life. One of the most common ways, God speaks in our circumstances. How many of you know that to be true? Where you start to see the circumstances in your life, we often call them open doors, like God opened a door, um, which we also have to be careful about because the Bible is also clear that not only God does God open doors, but the enemy can open doors too. Think about Jesus in Matthew 4. What is the enemy trying to do in Jesus of temptation? He's offering doors for Jesus to go through. So sometimes God speaks through our circumstances, and sometimes it's not God speaking at all. Through our thoughts and feelings. This is typically me, where things come to my mind or in my emotions, where it just like something's repeated in my mind, a thought or a feeling that just keeps coming up, and you realize like, oh, wait, this might be more than just my own thoughts, my own feelings. God might be speaking in this place. Now, the three probably most important ones um, for us in our context here in our life today is God speaks, first of all, through his written word, the scripture, the Bible. So when we hear, this is not just a book. It's actually um, a collection of books. It's a library. It's a whole set of different ways that God has spoken in time and in history. And so when you go to open this, we're not supposed to open it like a textbook or just a novel or an idea. What we're supposed to do is open this and not just try to read it or understand it, but actually go, God, what are you saying to me through this? Somehow in God's wisdom, in his kindness, in his grace, God has chosen to actually give us, aren't you glad like God has actually chosen to give us something that's constant, that's stable, that's steadfast, fast. The Bible says the word of God, it's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, that all scripture is God breathed. It's a place where God actually meets and speaks with us, which is why we need the written word of God. But not only do we need the written word, we need the living word, which is Jesus himself. Jesus is the living word. If you want to get to know God, if you want to know what God is like, if you want to know how God speaks, you need the living word. We have to look at Jesus, which we often do through the scripture. So for example, if, I don't, if I'm trying to understand something with God's voice in my life, I first of all say, does that sound or look or act like Jesus, the living word? And does it line up with the written word? But what most of us are probably talking about and asking about right now are personal words. What the Bible often, or what people in Christian history have talked about as the still, small voice, a gentle whisper, the quiet inner voice, God speaking to your heart, to your thoughts, God meeting you there. So why does God do that? Why doesn't God just speak to an, with an audible voice? Has anyone asked that question? No? <laughs> like, no one's asked that question. Okay, just me. I'll speculate. God, I, I believe God doesn't just speak with an audible voice all the time because God doesn't need a mouth to speak. Think about this. When you or I talk, when me and Joseph are talking about something, we, had, uh, we were talking this, yesterday morning at tea, and we're talking, and when we talk, we're using words, but what is real, what's really going on, we're connecting our thoughts, our emotions, our desires, our, our goals, our dreams, our hurt, every part of our life that's really internal. We're using words. We're using our mouth, and we're using our ears, but really, we're connecting, and we're do, using, doing something so much more deep. We're doing our thoughts and our emotions, and words are the means that we do it. Our ears are the means. But God doesn't need to use a mouth or just our ears to talk. Isn't it incredible that you could be in the middle of a crowded room with a thousand voices, but in that very moment, God could speak directly to you, right in your thoughts, right in your heart, right in the quiet space. This uh, past couple weeks ago, I read um, a book called Hearing God from Dallas Willard, and here's a few quotes from him about this. He says, the thoughts and feelings in the mind and spirit of one who is surrendered to God should be treated as if God were walking through one's personality with a candle, directing one's attention to things one after the other. As we become used to the idea that God is friendly 
and helpful, which means what we think about God and his posture towards us matters. God is friendly and helpful. Actually say that. God is friendly and helpful. That he desires to straighten, inform, and correct us for our good, as well as to comfort and encourage, and that he really does love us, then we can begin to pray heavily what the psalmist prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. So God actually comes to us in our thoughts. Willard also said, God comes to our spirits, our thoughts, emotions, and wills quietly because it most engages the faculties of free, intelligent beings that, in, that are involved in the work of God as his co-laborers and friends. Do you realize God wants you to be a free, smart, intelligent being? He's not interested in you being a robot. He's not interested in you being Alexa or Siri, who's just like perfectly programmed to do. Actually, he wants a creative, free, loving being. So here's a few questions about this. Can God really speak? Because I know there's some of us who, truthfully, we've either had hurt or we have questions or confusion. And so there's some real objections to hearing God's voice. So, like, here's three of them. First of all, there's a historical objection. Basically, we go, God's voice was just for those people in the Bible. And that's how some of us feel and some of us think. And I respect that you think that. I respect you as a person. I disagree with you, but I respect you. And um, with that, to that, I would just say this. Um, If we really believe that Christianity is about a relationship and not just a religion, then we need more than a history back then. We need a God who's active, alive, powerful today, speaking to his people right here and right now. And not only do we need that, don't we want that? Aren't you and I followers of Jesus? Aren't we exploring? Aren't we on different levels of the spectrum following Jesus? Because we actually deep down believe that God is not just out there, but he's actually come to meet with us in every single moment of our day. The second objection is the biblical objection. Well, I only need the Bible, right? Which um, typically cessationists go that route. I, again, disagree with them. Um, One, because if we only needed the, you don't just need, here's actually the better question. If you only need the Bible for what? Sure, to learn about God, yes. To learn about what Jesus has done, yes. To learn about who he is. But to actually have an active, present, living relationship with God, we need more than a book. We need the person of God to show up and illuminate. How many of us know plenty of people who know the scripture really well and don't know God at all? We need more than just the Bible. And to some degree, some people have become what I would call like biblical deists, like functionally biblical deists. Essentially, God gave us this book and it dropped from the sky and that's all I need. And now God is far and distant. And there couldn't be anything further from the truth that God is living and active and alive and closer than the very breath that we breathe. We only need the Bible, biblical objection. The third one, and that's probably with most of us, more of us in the room, personal objections. I've never heard God. I've never heard God. And to that, I would just lovingly say, maybe it's not so much that God isn't speaking, but maybe it's just that you and I need to learn how to listen. Maybe we just have to learn how to hear. That's not an insult. That's not a slam. It's actually a beautiful invitation. Nathan Finocchio, who um, spoke at Revive last semester, and he wrote this great book, which is available for spiritual life credit. um, He said this in his book, it's natural to have to grow in understanding just as it's natural for a kid to have to learn how to communicate in their first years. Dad doesn't learn to speak toddler, though he can understand it pretty well. Toddler learns to speak dad. I'm toddler God is dad. I must grow to hear him more to understand him better. We just have to learn how to hear God's voice. And aren't you glad that now you can have a relationship and talk with your physical parents and your biological parents and those in the world? You had to learn how to do that. And they taught you. And in the same way we do with God. um, But there's another group of people in this room who have likely experienced people misusing God's voice. And you're going, nah, 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 I can't do that. When I was in high school, Um, I told you about my pastor, my friend Ray, and um, he taught me a lot about hearing God's voice. But I I remember um, God really speaking to me through circumstances, through the scripture, through like all these events over and over and over about something I felt like God was going to tell me to do in my lifetime. And so he just, anyone ever had that where you're like, man, God just kind of gave me a vision or a dream or just something in my heart that I just can't shake. Um, and, And I remember to the point after months and months of like every time I'm praying, every time I'm reading my Bible, every time I go to a conference or church service, it's like Jesus is just like saying the same thing to the point where I was getting ready to go to a conference and I just said, okay, God, I get it. Like, I get it. The only, you've told me every single detail and thing you want me to do here. You basically said everything but the date to which God goes, ha ha. And I was at this conference and um, at the end of the conference, some random lady walks up to me and she goes, hey, I have a word from God from you. And I'm like, oh Lord. And um, I was like, uh, kind of skeptical, but she goes, actually, but before I give it, I want you to know, I went to your pastor and asked him if I could share this word with you. 
because I wanted to respect the leadership and the people who actually like hear God's voice also in your life. And they said, I could share this word with you. And she shared me this word that was just exactly thing after thing after thing after thing that God had been speaking to me for months. And I was just like weeping, like, oh my gosh. And um, at the end of it, she goes to walk away and she turns around and she goes, and you know, I just wouldn't be surprised in the next 10 years if you see something. And I was like, literally God gave me everything but a date and there's a date. And I remember walking away and um, to be honest though, 10 years has passed since that and I've seen some of those things and I haven't seen all of them. So did I hear wrong? Did she hear wrong? Did she speak wrong? It's a question I've actually had to wrestle with for the last few years of my life. But what I've come to figure out and learn is that people messing up God's hearing doesn't mean that God isn't speaking. And for many of us, we actually have to practice hearing God over and over and over and be okay messing up. Like, be okay messing up. Be okay messing up. And we have to learn that, but we keep engaging and we keep listening. We keep trying and go, I'm not going to write off every person who speaks into my life or every word from God because someone got it partially right and partially wrong. Paul says that we know in part and we prophesy in part. And truthfully, even when it comes to words and edification, things like that, Paul talks about they're always for edification, for encouragement, and for comfort. And this woman, when she came up to me, she edified me, she encouraged me, she comforted me, and she got the date wrong. And that's okay. So with that, how do I know God spoke? How do you know? Like, that's probably the question most of us. Like, you've heard something or you feel something and you're going, maybe God's speaking to me. How do I know if it's really God? Um, And to that, I will just give a few examples of how do we know anyone does anything or um, says anything. How do you really learn something? How do you learn someone's voice? We do it in life every single day. Think about this. If I put a bunch of colors on the screen... Um, and if I put, and I think I have a slide of that, with, if I put these colors, you could all identify that generally speaking, this color is red. <laughs> Don't know. I'm not making fun of that. Um, if I were to go, jump on that piano and play a major scale for musicians in the room, or, and then a minor scale, you could probably, hopefully, identify the difference between which one is major and which one's minor. If I were to have you all close your eyes, and I were to put um, athletic equipment in your hands, a few, like a basketball, soccer ball, baseball, you could all, with your eyes closed, probably tell me which one's which. How do we learn the things we learn? We learn the things we learn by effort and experimentation. And that is how we learn God's voice. We learn to hear God's voice from our own effort and from experimentation. So we try it out. We go, God, is this you? Maybe this is you. Okay, um, let me ask some mentors. Let me go to the scripture. Let me look at Jesus. Let me ask people in my life. Let me pray it out. Let me live into it. Let me be obedient. Uh Uh-oh. Let me be obedient and walk into some of those things and then sense, God, maybe this is you. How do we recognize any person's voice? I think we do any person's voice the same way we do God's voice. And here's three ways that we can do it. First of all, you listen for the sound of the person's voice. So I know the way Brenda, if Brenda calls me, which me and Brenda talk almost every day on the phone. I actually don't talk to anyone on the phone as much as I talk to Brenda, and it's because she's one of my best friends. And so Brenda and I talk on the phone all the time. I know what her voice sounds like. I pick up the phone and I go, that is Brenda. With God, well, for most of us, we probably won't hear an audible voice, even though we can ask God to do that, and he might do that. The difference is not audible, but there's a weight, an authority, maybe an attention-grabbing nature to it. So something God says, you go, wait a second, that grabs your attention a different way. Second of all, it's about personality. So when me and Brenda are talking on the phone, I know certain words that Brenda uses. She's also Canadian, so I know sometimes she'll say sorry a little bit different than I would say sorry. And um, she uses different things. I know her tone. I know the personality of her voice. Same with God. So we get to know Jesus. We open up the Bible. We get to see who Jesus is. Jesus is not in a hurry. Jesus is not angry. Jesus is kind. Jesus is loving. Jesus is encouraging. Jesus is correcting. Uh Uh-oh. Jesus is so patient with us. He's gentle and he's also firm. He's strong and he's meek. The voice of God. So sound, personality, and then content. I was, uh, me and Ye had uh, breakfast last week, or not breakfast, lunch last week, and we were talking about the best teriyaki spot in the city. And I know it's a contested debate in our community here. I will tell you here and now that it is I Love Teriyaki down in Totem Lake across the street from, um, oh, you got, from Ford or Taco Bell. There you go. Culture rep. You guys go to Taco Bell. Um, it's across the street from Taco Bell. I will tell you, and this is why it's the best teriyaki. It has nothing to do with my sermon, because some mama in that kitchen is taking that meat the night before, putting it in a 
baggie, marinating it, putting it in the fridge, and then the next morning grilling it up. She ain't, they're not doing the throw it on the grill, slap the sauce on like Toshi's. They're doing the real stuff where you marinate it. <laughs> and all my people who like real food said amen. Um, but Ye and I were talking, and we were talking about teriyaki, the best teriyaki spot. And she, and I agree with her, she's like, people are always like, Toshi's, Toshi's. And her and I are on the same page. She's like, that's kind of whack. And I'm like, yeah, it is pretty whack. And so um, if Ye were to text me right now, and she were to go, hey, you want to go grab lunch? Let's go to Toshi's. I'd be like, who has your phone, girl? Like, that's not you, because you don't talk about that. Do you remember being in junior high when, like, you remember being in junior high when someone would, like, grab your friend's phone, maybe it was, like, your crush, and they'd text for you? But you knew because of the way that they talk and the personality, you knew that's not them. So it is with God's voice. We learn to hear God's voice because we know how he speaks, the sound, the personality, and the content. Here's how um, we're just about, oh, we're at the end of this. Here we go. Why does God speak? Maybe the most important question for the next few weeks. Why does God speak? I deeply believe that God speaks primarily to have relationship with us, not just to give direction to us. And I actually will venture to say, if we are people who only want to get to hear God's voice for the purpose of direction, we'll never really learn how to hear God's voice. Could you imagine having a friend who only calls you when they need something? Like you actually don't get to know them because you don't get to know their real thoughts, their real heart, their real character, their real emotion. You're just asking for things all the time. I'm not saying, now, God is a good father and we should boldly ask, amen? Amen. But God wants something so much more than being a glorified vending machine. Or for most of us, maybe a glorified Waze or Apple Maps or Google Maps. God, left or right, when God just goes, I wanna go through life with you, not just tell you what to do. Actually, in my own life, I'm learning right now, um, and, it's, and I think the older we get and the more mature we get in Christ, actually, in some ways, God stops to give us, God gives us fewer lefts and rights in life, and he actually starts to go, what do you want to do with me? Because we become the sort of people who already have a will and a desire and thoughts that are surrendered to God, God doesn't have to tell you left or right anymore. Think about this. When you're five years old, you need to ask your parents to do everything, and it's actually maturity for a five-year-old to go, dad, mom, what should I do? But when you're 25 years old, it's no longer maturity to ask your parents what you should eat for dinner, which way to go in life. And maybe it is with God, where the older and the more mature we get, and again, the more mature we grow in Christ, the more our lives are surrendered to his will, God stops going left or right, and God goes, let's just go together. What do you desire? What do you want to do? And God also starts to begin to speak into our desires and our wills. Maybe some of you in the room, and probably I'm speaking to maybe some upperclassmen who are about to leave. Maybe some of you have been asking God for which way do I go, left or right? And God's going, man, like your will's already surrendered to me. What do we want to do together in life? And if we become people who are cultivate hearts that are still obedient, then you don't have to be afraid of messing up. Because guess what? You know, if I go left and really God wanted me to go right, if my heart's obedient, then I'll still go, God, is this the right way? And you'll go, actually, baby, let's turn left. And then we go left and the world keeps on spinning. It's a beautiful thing to have that sort of relationship with God. My mom um, was born in a village in Africa um, in this small village called Beggy. And my mom, um, some of you have heard her story. I think I have a picture of her when she was a little girl. I look so much like my mom. Um, (laughs) But I remember, I remember uh, my mom telling me this story about my mom, um, was separated from her parents at birth. She has prosthetic legs. It's a crazy story. I'm thankful that I'm here today. Um, so my birthday is a celebration of my mom's life, not my own. And my mom is clear about that. And so um, <laughs> she's like, happy birthday, son. You're welcome. I'm like, all right. Um, but I remember uh, my mom telling me this story about when she, when 2001, my mom had this desire because she had three kids now and we were growing up. She had this desire to go and meet her birth parents. She'd never met them her whole life. She was in her 40s. So it's a really long story. It was actually on national news on 2020. You can go look it up. The short version is she ends up, the last night of her trip, after searching and searching and searching, the last night of her trip, she finds her in this small hut in the middle of Ethiopia. And my mom's sitting there because she has prosthetic legs. Her mom walks in the room and her mom, called, my mom's name is Lydia, but, my, but her mom calls her Sadia calls her a different name. 
And immediately my mom recognized her mom's voice and recognized that name. Because there's something about a parent, and dare I say our spiritual father, who when he calls our name, something about our heart gets it. No matter how long you've been distant from God, no matter how long you've ignored his voice, no matter how long you haven't paid attention or listened to it, when God calls your name, something about you says, here I am. Your child's listening. And that's the sort of people that we can be. Could you imagine your life like that? It's just constantly, God, everywhere you go, God, what are you saying? If you're going through the devotional, Brenda wrote a bomb one today, and the practice for today was to, whenever you walk through a door, take a second to stop and consider that God might be speaking, you, speaking to you as you walk into this next room or this next space. What if every room we went into, we realized was another room where God already was and he was waiting just to be with us? Not to give us direction, just to talk about everything going on in life. So how do I start hearing? Here's some practicals, and if you want to write these down, fantastic. First of all, pray. Like, ask God to speak, and ask God to make you a person who hears. Second of all, pay attention. Attention is the, lo- is the language of love. We all know that because we all have the friend who you're having the conversation with, and they're also texting, and you feel devalued when that happens. But also, we all know what it's like when someone really listens to you and they're with you and they're there and they're present, not even always talking, just available to you. What if throughout our days we just said, God, I'm going to pay attention. Maybe you're trying to do something with me right here. The other day I was driving, actually listening to that Christ um, song that we just sang, the second song, and um, I was just like, oh, I can be with God right now. And I just like, God, thanks for being here. I listened to that song, and I don't cry too often except when it pertains to my brothers moving. And um, I just began to cry in the car because it was just like the sense of God's presence. He was there. I didn't even have to say anything, but I just began to pay attention. Remain in the written word. I can't stress this enough. Bible before phone, Bible before bed. If you want to get to know Jesus' voice, Just remain in the word. He's already spoken and he continues to speak through that. But don't just remain in the word. Get to know the living word. So don't just open your Bible to read information like you read for whatever class you're reading for, as great as that is. Open the Bible to get to know God. To get to know God. And lastly, like we talked about last week, create time and space. (laughs) Create time and space. We must design our lives in a way that is conducive to hearing and paying attention to God's voice. What church traditions have called um, that over the years is a rule of life, creating a rule, a roadmap, a a way to direct your life to stay in loving relationship with God. And so um, in our last few minutes, and what we like to do at the end of chapel on Wednesdays is just make a practice or try out or rhythm or try hearing God. And so what we've designed for you, and it's taken like weeks and weeks, and if you see Syrah Cantor, go thank her so much. If you see Syrah, thank her, thank her, because she helped put this together. But if you wouldn't mind pulling out your phone as we do now or the app, which is fantastic, what I want you to do is um, either use this QR code or or um, go to, I believe it's under formation growth resources. So if you go in the app or use the QR code, open up and click on formation and then growth resources. And in there, you'll see what we're calling a rule of life worksheet. Essentially, it's a worksheet where you take some time to make, make conscious decisions about what your life with Jesus is gonna be like. What is your relationship with God gonna look like? That involves your body, it involves your attention, it involves your habits, it involves your money, it involves your sexuality, it involves every part of your life. How am I going to live with Jesus this semester? So we're going to take about five minutes, and what I want you to do, um, and I just really encourage you, over the next weeks, maybe you'd use it, we don't have homework in chapel, awesome, Um, but what I really, I really, 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 I'm doing this for my own life, but I encourage you, um, take some time and maybe pick one or two sections to do this. And you'll see on this rule of life that there's an actual, a chart where you could fill out what the rhythms of your life, both daily, weekly, and even maybe monthly could be with Jesus. So what I want you to do is pull out your phone, use that rule of life worksheet for the next five minutes, consider just look at section one about your relationship with Jesus. Go through section one just today. You can, it's actually a fill, it's fillable, so you can save it to your phone or your computer. And then I encourage you, maybe in the next few days, take some time to go through this. Do it with a friend or a trusted somebody in your life and talk about what are the rhythms of the lifestyle. How are you going to create a life that is conducive to hearing God's voice? God does speak. We just become people who learn how to listen. So why don't you do this for the next four minutes, and then um, afterwards we'll come and close out the gathering.